Um, my apologies if you can't read at all, but on the far side, way out in front, is my Monash, which is our portal. And as we come back, um, library databases, and there hasn't been a lot of discussion about that, but that's a, obviously a big issue uh, in all institutions. Museo is our Monash University Studies Online and so on, back down. Um, there are others such as Interlearn, which is a, a, a small um, uh, web application that was developed by a colleague and I back in the late 90s. Um, uh, not exactly a full LMS, but certainly a web-based interactive um, software tool. And there are whole lots of others, including podcasting, um, which is developing just so rapidly. And these things challenge our institutions. We have a particular champion uh, within our unit, or one of our champions on podcasting, including our vice chancellor, if, you, if he's got very interested in podcasting. So his monthly newsletters are now podcasts. So he, he loves that sort of thing. But there was one particular lecturer, in fact, he was an assistant lecturer, a couple of years ago got fairly excited about podcasting. And he claims that he rang up the IT services section and said, I want some help with podcasting. And whoever answered the phone said, what's podcasting? Um, so he did it himself. And he's an assistant lecturer in marketing, um, developed some podcasts, and they are very, very good. They're mounted on iTunes, um, so his students could go visit them, download them, listen to them. And what he found is that over the couple of semesters or so that he was running it, he was getting a larger audience. So much so that now on iTunes, he has hit uh, the top 40 educational podcasting sites. So the challenge for him and for the university, how do we encourage such champions and such creativity? How do we support the development of podcasting at Monash? Okay, just getting back to our portal, for example, you can see the sort of scale that, we're, that, that we have to deal with. Um, we first built the portal back in 2000. It was released in 2001. I mean, most people have portals. I'm not going to look at it. But we don't talk much about them, but they are, in essence, as far as institutions are concerned, our primary online tool. And you can see by the usage um, with respect of our portal because it's convenient, it's useful, it's refreshed, um, and students love it. It's convenient, it's relevant, it's adaptable. And you can see of, with respect to users, but at, at any one time, at any one moment, typically through the day, there will be three and a half to 4,000 uh, students on the portal. At the same time, our Monash University Studies Online Muso, um, at any one time, will typically have two to two and a half, um, but the overall usage, as you can see, uh, is, is very high. And the number of units, our units, for example, I'm talking about subjects here. So per semester, we're running about 1,800 units on Muso. So these are the challenges that we've had to respond to. Okay, I refer now, what, what else are we doing or have we done? Uh, remember this morning's slide about the room? Video conferencing. Back in the 1990s, late 1990s, our IT faculty set up a virtual tea room so that you went to, when you wandered into the tea room, there's the big screen like this, and you could sit there, enjoy your coffee. Um, essentially, we have two very large main campuses at Clayton and Caulfield. They are 15 kilometres apart, um, and so staff of that faculty were split and they were able to, to ch chat to each other, have meetings and seminars. Um, that's more the sort of morning tea idea. That was actually the grand opening where they had the ribbon to be cut both at one end and at the other end. And they cut it simultaneously. That was the vice chancellor at the time. Um, and just getting back, it was handy. Yes, it was a tea room, but it was also a good seminar room. And they ended up setting it up so that Here's the front, and here the people sitting down the back were actually at the other location. And I was talking to David Abraham Abramson. Um, I talked to him about this, and he was saying it, he found right off the bat it worked really well. In his very first presentation, someone back here would put up their hand, and he was able to respond to queries. 
Now, I'd like to step to something else. Um, we've talked a lot about online technologies. Let's think about something that we have in our schools, in our universities, laboratories. Um, how is technology supporting um, teaching and learning in laboratories? We have a particular example at Monash that I believe is an exemplar, and it's not so much an exemplar because of the technology, but because of the underpinning and, 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 and the background. This is truly pedagogically driven. Now, we know what a, a typical laboratory looks like, biological sciences, a microscope lab. You have all the, the benches, the microscopes. Typically, students work singly or in pairs. They come along, they put their specimens in, they look at them. If they're working in pairs, they take it in turns to have a look at the specimens. If they get confused, don't know what they're looking at, they call the tutor over to come and have a look as well. And the head of that school insists that all his staff get some teacher training. And that's the difference between schools and universities. To teach in a university, typically you don't have to have any background uh, or teacher training. Uh, in schools, you do. But we actually run a graduate certificate in higher education that's fundamentally a teaching qualification for teachers. All the teachers in this school do that course. So they tend to think educationally, pedagogically, very seriously all the time. And if they wanted to improve their laboratory teaching. Uh, what did they do? How could they make it? Why do we all have to be, why does it have to be so individual? Why, how can we share more? How can we share what we're looking at, share the excitement around the whole class? How can the teacher become more involved and quickly have a look at what everyone's looking at um, on a slide? So I'm going to show you a short video presentation of what the solution is and, and what the next stages might be. An image in a microscope is conventionally ephemeral. It is only there when being observed. Now we can capture, save, annotate and incorporate it into other media. It is no longer just an image, it becomes knowledge. The system encourages collaborative learning among students because a big screen can accommodate a number of students around it as distinct from a single microscope and they can interact with the material, the teacher and other students. technology allows us to teach on a range of scales, from the individual student, to small groups, through to classes, and even to classes between schools. The system also gives the teacher tremendous flexibility in sharing individual projects around the class, among other activities in the class. This mode of teaching accelerates and enhances the development of their microscopy skills in what is traditionally a very individual and isolating process. With it being a digital system based on computers, it enables immediate integration of data collection, analysis and interpretation. It has opened up a whole new capacity to teach in an exciting and engaging way.